Um, this is Ustad Adnan Rashid, his, um, his great grandfather Maulana Minhaj, Minhaj ud Din Haz Hazarwi was a great scholar uh, and a student of Sheikh Mia Nazir Hussein Dilwi. His father and grandfather and family is involved in knowledge and dawah. Um, Ustad Adnan Rashid obtained a degree in history and has been involved in dawah activities with many organizations and appears on Islam channel. He, de uh, he debated prominent Christian scholars such as James White. Um, and today his topic is um, about removing doubts about the four rightly guided sahabas. And Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أدخلوا في السلم كافة ولا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم آية, آية الإيمان حب الأنصار وآية النفاق بغض الأنصار Oh, come on, call, alayhi salatu salam. Respected brothers and sisters, today, inshallah, we will be addressing a very important topic. And that topic is doubts about the Sahaba spread by the Shia school of thought. Now, this, let me clarify from the beginning is not an exercise to spread hate or to criticize a school of thought or to degrade anyone for that matter rather the purpose of this exercise or this lecture today is to share our compassion our love our mercy with our brothers and sisters in humanity primarily the Shia brothers and sisters and then whoever may be interested in the topic so a lot of the Shia brothers and sisters out there, they think that Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah, they hate the Ahlul Bayt or they do not truly follow the Ahlul Bayt and by extension they hate those who love the Ahlul Bayt, i.e. the Shia. This is a huge mis misconception spread by many proponents of the Shia school of thought. We do not hate anyone. We are told to invite people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with hikmah and maw'izatul hasana as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded in the Quran A'udhu billahi min shaitani rajeem Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ud'u ila sabili rabbik bil hikmah wa maw'izatul hasana wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan we will be discussing this issue um, in relative um, depth. We will try our best to cover as much content as possible. Uh, there's a lot to cover. Ulama, our scholars, have written books upon books for the last 1,000 years. Many books have been written, monumental books, in some, case, uh, in some cases, where the scholars of Islam have dealt with uh, some of the arguments or shubahat or doubts raised by the Shia school uh, with regards to the sanctity of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. There is no doubt that the Shia, they do believe in Allah and His, and his Messenger. Um, but when it comes to the companions of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, his disciples, uh, his direct students, the Shia and the Sunni are divided on this matter. The, the Shia take one stance, which is uh, that most of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, were simply not trustworthy and uh, according to some, they apostatized from, from Islam after the Prophet died and they were not true Muslims. That's why they showed the true colors after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, passed away after he died. On the other hand, the Sunni school, Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah, who are in the majority, who are the majority of Muslims today in the world, uh, 
I would say over 80% of the Muslims today are uh, from the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Uh, they are of the view that without the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is no Quran and there is no Islam. This is the view. And this view is very consistent with history. For example, think about it. If the character of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is doubted, then who transmitted the Quran from the Prophet? We never met the Prophet. We never see we have we have never seen the Prophet. So how did the Quran come to us? It came to us through the companions of the Messenger of Allah. They took the Quran from the Prophet, they learnt it, they memorized it, they penned it, they preserved it, they protected it, and then they gave it to posterity. They gave it to their followers, their students who were Tabi'un. Those who learnt directly from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And then the Tabi'un gave the Quran in its pure form as it was de delivered to them by the companions to their students. And then the chain reaches us uninterrupted. We have about 30 people between us and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi depending on what chain you belong to. So there are chains of memorization coming directly from the Prophet ﷺ to our day. There are Hufaz, memorizers of the Quran in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in Mauritania, in Malaysia, in Pakistan, in India, all over the world, in the Muslim world, people who memorize the Quran and they take authority from the teacher and their teacher took authority from their teachers and then the line goes back to the Prophet Sallallahu Prophet Muhammad uninterrupted and in this line Ashab Rasul the companions of the Prophet are the most important people because they are the ones who took the Quran so even the Shia today the Quran they read is the Quran that that was standardized in its current form by Uthman bin Affan radiallahu an, one of the earliest Muslims, one of the earliest companions of the Prophet of Islam, and the son-in-law, the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam twice, because Uthman was married to two of the daughters of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, one after another. So he was married to Umm Kulthum and Ruqayya. So if Uthman radiallahu an standardized the Quran <clears throat> and if, if, if the Shia, some of the Shia scholars if they believe or Shia proponents if they believe that Uthman was a disbeliever, a murtad or even someone who was possibly one of the worst people to walk the planet according to the Shia view then why would you read Quran collected by him is the question. If I was told today that the Quran came from Qadriya, Jahmiya, Mu'tazila, right? Or Khawarij, I would be worried. I would be worried, right? And there's no doubt that some of the Khawarij were Qura. They were Qura. They were readers of the Quran. They were reciters of the Quran. Okay? And we have reasons to even trust the Khawarij. But imagine if I was to if I was told that the Quran came from Abu Jahl. Or the Quran came from Abu Lahab or Uqba bin Abi Mu'id. Imagine some of the biggest enemies of Islam would have, would I have any confidence in the Quran? Do I have any reasons to have confidence in the Quran? So how can our Shia, how can our, can our Shia brothers and sisters have confidence in the Quran which was in its current form preserved, collected, transmitted by Uthman bin Affan an, and his committee, part of which was Ali bin Abi Talib, thankfully. So today we will be talking about these issues and why this issue in particular. We have a text in front of us and this text is known as Tuhfa Ithna Ashariya. This book or this 
uh, compendium or this encyclopedic, encyclopedic book was written by a scholar named Shah Abdul Aziz bin Shah Waliullah bin Shah Abdul Rahim and Shah Abdul Aziz was born in 1745 in Delhi in a very chaotic time uh, sorry in, 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 in a very chaotic period uh, this was uh, the, the, the period this was a time when the Mughal Empire was in sharp decline in uh, India and about six years before Shah Abdul Aziz was born Delhi the center of Muslim power in India was devastated by a Persian invasion uh, this invasion was led uh, by a man called Nadir Shah who was the ruler of Persia and he had decided to attack the Mughal Empire because it was already weakened by uh, uh, attacks internally so Nadir Shah saw an opportunity to get rich uh, very fast he had an army and he knew the Mughals are not able to confront him he attacked India and he devastated the city of Delhi and he became rich beyond his imagination beyond his imagination there are reports that he picked up so much gold and silver and so much uh, uh, you know pro uh, treasure from Delhi that there were camel loads of these things heading towards Persia from Delhi to Persia including the peacock throne famous peacock throne uh, which had the Kohenur diamond in it the mountain of light diamond which is today found where where is it found where is it today Muslims mashallah where is it huh where is it in the crown the crown the queen of England wears today Queen Elizabeth II the Kohenur diamond is found in the crown it is one of the most expensive diamonds in the history of humanity because of its size unfortunately it was reduced more than half in size by Albert uh, the husband of Queen Victoria um, uh, because it was it was not cut properly so when they cut it they reduced it into less than half unfortunately what you find today is less than half of the Kohenur diamond and it has a very huge history and if you want to read the history of this particular diamond how many hands it exchanged and where it went and how it came and where it came and how it came you need to read William Dalrymple's book the Kohenur diamond he has written recently it was published less than a year ago this book and the details are there so cut the long story short part of this plunder this treasure which Nadir Shah had looted from Delhi was the diamond which was of course studded into the throne it was called the Pequot throne it was made by Shah Jahan one of the most powerful Mughal emperors so he became rich and Shah Abdul Aziz was born six years later um, in the house of Shah Waliullah al Dehlavi who was already an established scholar in Delhi Shah Waliullah was one of the greatest scholars who ever lived in the Indian subcontinent he produced uh, unique works in India he pioneered the study of hadith in India hadith sciences were neglected in India in India scholars of Islam were mainly into studying uh, logic mathematics uh, medicine uh, philosophy and fiqh uh, in particular the Hanafi fiqh right but the science of hadith was neglected for a very long time although there were some scholars of hadith but they did not pioneer the science of hadith as uh, did Shah Waliullah Muhaddis Dehlavi Rahmatullah so Shah Waliullah born in Delhi realized that there is a lack of the understanding of the science of hadith in the Indian subcontinent so when he was a young man he traveled to Hijaz he traveled as a young man in his late 20s 
1731, the father of Shah Abdul Aziz, the man we are discussing today, he traveled to Hijaz to seek some knowledge and he sought the knowledge of Hadith. Within 14 months, he was able to cover chunky volumes of Hadith with scholars and he took authority from them in Hadith and he brought back this knowledge to India and subsequently wrote books on the science of Hadith and commentaries on Hadith. For example, there's a very famous commentary on the Muatta of Imam Malik written by Shah Waliullah titled Al Musawwa and Al Musaffa, one in Persian, one in the Arabic language, so that he can introduce another view in the Indian subcontinent because the Hanafi school was very rigid and the Hanafi scholars in India uh, were extremely rigid. So he deliberately wrote a commentary on Muatta of Imam Malik to introduce the Hanafis of India to another view based upon Hadith. So this was a new beginning in India. And Shah Abdul Aziz, who was also a Muhaddith, Muhaddith is a scholar of Hadith, someone who has mastered the sciences of Hadith. For example, Ilm al-Rijal, Diraya or Riwaya, and uh, Ilal, you name it, uh, he had mastered uh, these sciences because, because of his father. So Shah Abdul Aziz, born in 1745, was taught primarily by his father and he talks about his father with utmost respect and, and, and honor. Uh, his father was his role model like Shah Waliullah's father was uh, his role model. So uh, Shah Waliullah put a lot of stress in teaching his children. He had four sons. The eldest was Abdul Aziz, the man we are talking about and Shah Waliullah died in 1762. Um, um, leaving his son behind who was at that time about 17 years old and Shah Abdul Aziz upon the death of his father took over from his father and started to teach tafsir and hadith in Delhi while Delhi is under attack on daily basis, monthly basis every year something new is happening another army is invading Delhi because this century, this 18th century was a chaotic century for the Muslims of India in particular if not for all Indians, definitely for the Muslims of India, this was a chaotic period. And one of the most important developments took place in the time of Shah Abdul Aziz when he was growing up in Delhi. Uh, the Shia had gained a lot of influence in the Indian politics uh, because, of the, because of a state that was governed by uh, Iranian uh, Shias, uh, Shias who had come from Iranian background and this state was called the state of Awadh um, and the capital was Lucknow and this is where the Shias had accumulated a lot of power, a lot of influence and they were, they were using their influence to uh, change things in Indian politics and this is why Shah Waliullah when he wrote a letter to the king of Afghanistan Ahmad Shah inviting him to come to India to protect the Muslims against all these threats. Two people he talked about in particular in this letter uh, were Safdar Jang who was the ruler of Awad, the Shia ruler of Awad and the other one was a Jat uh, uh, leader or a Jat ruler, Hindu Jat ruler. His name was um, Suraj Mal. So these are the two people Shah Waliullah complained about in this letter written to the King of Afghanistan, Ahmad Shah Abdali. And the letter can be found in um, a collection which is unfortunately it's only in Urdu. You cannot get it in uh, the English uh, language. But subsequently we hope that someone will inshallah translate these works into the English language. So Shah Waliullah had all, done all this work. Um, so his son inherited these problems. When he grew up in Delhi, uh, the Shia had grown in influence and the general of the Mughal army, the, the remaining Mughal army was none other than a man called Najaf Ali Khan. Najaf Ali Khan, he was the general of the Mughal army and he was the most powerful man uh, in Delhi as well as possibly in North India because he was the, the general. He was the leader of the Mughal army. Uh, thank you. So, Najaf Ali Khan was a problem politically and he was causing a lot of problems for the Sunni ulama. A lot of the Sunni ulama were being killed 
or were being assassinated in mysterious circumstances. One of them was Mirza Mazhar uh, Jani Janan, uh, who was a Sufi, uh, Sufi inclined uh, Muslim scholar in Delhi with a large following. He was killed, assassinated in mysterious circumstances. And one thing uh, that was clear about him was that he would criticize uh, the Shia influence, growing Shia influence in politics and in theology. So Shah Abdul Aziz, who was still um, growing and seeing all these circumstances take place, and he realized because of the political influence of the Shia school, because of the political power the Shia held in India, the school became very popular among the masses as well. A lot of the people, you see, if the ruler belongs to a particular school of thought and he wants to promote it through his power, his money, his influence, it is easy for him to do so, right? And it so happens in history when, and Ibn Khuldun talked about this theory, that when people are politically dominated or militarily dominated, it is very easy or very likely for them to follow the culture of the dominator, right? Or the culture of the 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 victor if you like okay so this is what Ibn Khuldun talked about in his uh, Muqaddama as well uh, as, as, a, as a social philosophy what happens when nations are occupied when nations are dominated when nations are subdued they very often follow the culture or the religion or the ways of the dominant power like what happened during the British Raj when Britain was governing India, it influenced the people so much that uh, the people uh, took off their Mughal clothing uh, and they started to put on British clothing to mix into the powerful circles to, to, to get acceptance from what we call assimilation. Uh, so the Indians became um, anglicized, right? They started to dress like the English, they started to speak the English language, they abandoned the Persian language and the Arabic tradition even the Hindus back in the day used to learn the Persian language to get better jobs, right? But that had changed now because Britain had come to power in India. English language was promoted, systematically promoted by the government. And that meant the Hindus and the Muslims now had to adopt the English culture and the language and clothing that came with it. And lo and behold, we have what we have today, right? So... This, this is exactly what was happening. And Shah Abdul Aziz growing up in Delhi was worried about this situation. That Shia influence is, has entered every single home, uh, if not in Delhi, uh, generally in North India. And he was quite worried about this situation. So what he did was, he planned to write a book to protect the Sunnis or to protect the, uh, uh, the Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah and um, their theological uh, sense of, um, how can I put it, superiority, if you want to call it, right? Or to satisfy them theologically that your view or what you follow is the haq, it's the truth. And any doubts spread by the Shia brothers and sisters can be easily answered, right? And nowhere did Shah Abdul Aziz promote sectarian violence or killing of each other. Rather, he wrote an academic book uh, to clarify the position of the Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And then this book was completed in 1780. To be precise, the year was 1780 CE. Okay, when Shah Abdul Aziz was almost, uh, how old was he if he was born in 1745? 35? He was 35 years old, Allahu Akbar. Shah Abdul Aziz at this, time, at this time was nearly 35. Is it 35? Yeah, yeah. 1780 when the book was complete, right? So he was nearly 35 years old when he had completed this book. And let me tell you something, something about this book. This book is so powerful. It fell as, as a thunderbolt on the Shias of India in particular and the Shias of the world in general, right? So shaken were the Shias of India by this book that some of the rulers who were very powerful with a lot of money had put aside 10,000 rupees. One of them, one of the rulers, 
he had put aside 10,000 rupees. You know what that meant in the, uh, in the, in the 18th century? We're not talking about 10,000 rupees Indian or Pakistani today. It, it, it's worth nothing. 10,000 is like 100 pounds today, right? Unfortunately. But in the 18th century, 10,000 rupees could buy you, a, buy you an estate. You could buy an estate. You, can, you could buy large chunks of land, possibly a small country, with 10,000 rupees, right? This is how much, how much money uh, it was at that time. It was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. Uh, if you have seen those silver rupees from the Mughal period in the 18th century, uh, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So 10 grams of silver multiplied by 10,000. Think about it. That's a, that's a lot of money at that time. Okay. So one of the Shia rulers, he put aside 10,000 rupees for any Shia scholar, whether Iranian, Persian, or Safavi, or Indian, to write a response to Tuhfa Ithna Asharia. Write a response to it. And 25 responses were attempted. 25 responses. And according to the Sunni scholars, none of them satisfactory enough for them to even treat it seriously. Right? And you can only realize what I'm talking about um, when you actually read the book. Okay? Unfortunately, the book is only available in Persian. The original language it was written in because it was meant for the elite in India. The, the elite language in India at the time in the 18th century was the Persian language. So that's why Shah Abdul Aziz wrote it in a language that was understood by the elite so that they cannot be influenced enough into Shiaism to fall into Shiaism. Because there, are, there were entire states fell into Shiaism. Entire states. One of the states is Rampur. Rampur became a Shia state. Uh, in the 19th century purely because some women from the state from the royal family had adopted the, uh, the Shia religion or the Shia view on Islam and then they were able to influence the Nawabs the rulers the kings uh, by the love and compassion and the, what we call in the call in Urdu Adain you know right <laughs> how, how would you translate Adain into English language hmm? Ali bhai? Gifts, <laughs> no, good no, no. treatment, behavior. No. Um, seduction, you can call it seduction. Yeah. So some of the ru rulers of this state, this state, ironically, you wouldn't believe this. Uh, the founder of the state of Rampur, Rampur in, is in a, in a region of India called Rohilkhand. Rohilkhand was actually governed by Pashtuns, Pathan rulers. Okay. And one of the first rulers of this state was a man called Hafiz Rahmat Khan. Hafiz Rahmat Khan had written a book in a refutation of the Shia because the, the influence was growing in the 18th century. So he had, he had written a book to refute uh, the Shia school of thought uh, and he wrote a history of the Pashtuns as well uh, side by side in this very book. Uh, the book is titled Khulasatul Ansab. Khulasatul Ansab, it is a history of the Pashtuns and within the history of the Pashtuns he has put down refutation of the Shia school of thought, right? And then ironically some of his descendants later on they ended up becoming Shia. This is how strong the influence was. This is how some of the powerful elite were turning to the Shia school of thought in India. That's why Shah Abdul Aziz realized that something has to be done. Something must be done and he wrote this book called Tuhfa Ithna Asharia and it was thoroughly researched. Shah Abdul Aziz, one of the unique features of this book is that he thoroughly studied the books of the Shia school of thought. Their major books written by their major scholars, primarily the books of the Shia Hadith. And by the way, before I continue, let me explain. The, the Shia Hadith is to be found in four books and they are called Al Qutub Al Arba. Okay? Um, the four books, right? Uh, and what are they? Al Kafi, written by uh, Muhammad bin Yaqub al Kulaini, and that is the most important book for the Shia school of thought. The Shia theology, the Shia fiqh, is based upon Al Kafi, right? It's taken from a book called Al Kafi. And then there is Man la Yahdur al Fakih, there is Al Istabsar, 
and there is a tahdeeb these are the four books of the shia school of thought al kafi is the most important one and then the sunni ahl sunnati wal jamaa we have sahasitta okay uh, bukhari muslim abu daud tirmizi ibn Maj, uh, nasai and ibn majah right uh, and some even add muatta imam malik in fact shawaliullah was of the opinion that muatta imam malik should be uh, part of the sahasitta not ibn majah so there is this valid opinion among some of the muhaddisin that muatta should be given precedence over ibn majah so this shows you that shia source of knowledge on hadith on theology on fiqh is different to the sunni sources the sunnis primarily take the sunnah that's why we call sunnis ahl sunnati wal jamaa what is sunnah sunnah is the tradition of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is delivered by the prophet to his companions so it is the companions of messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam who tell us what the prophet did said and agreed to okay that is sunnah what he did said and agreed to okay on the other hand the shia school traces back its uh, tradition to primarily two imams not even not the prophet listen carefully now not the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam not his companions not even ali bin abi talib not even ali bin abi talib who then two imams mainly imam muhammad al baqir and imam jafar al sadiq these two imams are the main sources of shia theology as they claim and in due course we will see why that claim is actually not worthy of much attention right uh, when our shia brothers and sisters again when i use the term shia brothers and sisters this means we want to share our love and compassion and mercy with our brothers and sisters there are people out there who genuinely want to listen they want to know the differences they want to understand the differences and this lecture is a gesture of compassion mercy and love we have no hate to share we only have love and compassion to share so you must understand that this is not an exercise to spread hate and discontent rather this is an exercise of love and compassion and mercy so please my brothers and sisters those who are listening take this lecture in that spirit not in a spirit of uh trying to spread uh um, um division or more antagonism between the two communities because there is a, there has been a lot of sectarianism unfortunately especially in places like pakistan uh where a lot of killing has taken place and we really really we we condemn that killing from the depth of our heart we don't want any innocent people dying anywhere on the planet uh, let alone you know you know we don't even want animals to die let alone let, let alone humans our messenger rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has forbade us from such things so this is something to open our hearts towards each other so that we can listen to each other carefully inshallah ta'ala so um our shia brothers and sisters in humanity when they claim that we follow the ahlul bayt uh and the way of the ahlul bayt is better than the way of the companions or messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is a very erroneous idea it cannot be substantiated in the light of historical evidence let me very quickly explain what i mean by that and shah abdul aziz in this book talks about it In fact I will talk about it uh, when when the time comes inshallah taala in in due course in the lecture. So um this book was written for that reason as I have already explained the historical background a lot of homes powerful families a lot of the Indian Muslims had been influenced by Shia school of thought and Shia philosophy and Shia thinking and Shia arguments and Shia uh, shubhat doubts spread about the sanctity of the sahaba ashabur rasul radiyallahu anhum ajma'in this is one of the reasons why shah waliullah wrote a book titled izalatul khifa an khilafatil khulafa shah waliullah muhaddis ad-dahlawi 
he wrote this book titled Izalatul Khifa An Khilafatil Khulafa uh, removing of the veil okay uh, from the Khilafa of the Khulafa so he wrote this very powerful book to remove doubts uh, cast uh, casted by uh, you know um, by Shia school of thought in India uh, from uh, the Khilafa of Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman radiallahu anhum and then Shah Abdul Aziz's son wrote this book Tuhfa Itna Sharia. I believe Tuhfa Itna Sharia is one of the best treatments in the history of Islam of the Shia school of thought. Shia school of thought. You may be shocked to hear this now. There are many books that were written before it. There were many books that were written after it. But this book stands as a monument to this day. And Shia scholars tried to respond, uh, respond to it in the 19th century primarily. And as I said, 25, nearly 25 responses were written on this book. One particular book I really would like you to read on this topic. And it is written by a Shia historian from India. His name is, his name is Athar Abbas Ridwi. He has written a book on Shah Abdul Aziz's life. It's, it is a biography of Shah Abdul Aziz's life and uh, um, some part of the book is on the biography, the history of Shah Abdul Aziz, his birth, his education, his circumstances and most of the book is basically on Tuhfa Ithna Sharia. So to be fair you should go and read that book as well uh, as to what a Shia historian had to say about this book and he talks about all the responses written by Shia scholars on this particular book. This book is available online, you can find it, Athar Abbas Rizwi uh, and uh, the book is titled Shah Abdul Aziz. Okay, Google it and you will find the book inshallah ta'ala and this book is written on this personality and on this book. So he talks about in detail who wrote the response where it was written and what was the response to the response okay so what did Shah Abdul Aziz uh, wanted what did he want to achieve from this particular book he made it very clear in the preface that the school the Shia thinking has spread all over North India and it has become uh, indispensable for me to treat this topic and for this reason I write the book to protect the Muslims from any further deviation. So this was a very comprehensively researched book. Now some people prefer Minhaj Sunnah of Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah which was a response to a Shia scholar who had written a book called Minhaj Al Kirama. Minhaj Al Kirama was written by a man called Ibn Al Mutahar Ibn Al Mutahar Hilli. Okay, Ibn Al Mutahar Hilli had written this book for the ruler of Afghanistan who was a Mongol who had adopted the Shia school as his way and to satisfy him Ibn al-Mutahar had written that book and a copy of that book came to Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah so Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi he started to write a response which ended up in four volumes Minhaj al-Sunnah a very rich a very beneficial and a very powerful book no doubt but the uslub of that book is different to Tuhfa Ibn Sharia. That book was a response to a particular scholar. Tuhfa is a general treatment of the Shia school and its history. So what does Shah Abdul Aziz do in this book? What is his uslub? You will see from the content, I will read the content very quickly so that you understand what uh, direction Shah Abdul Aziz took uh, in this regard. Okay. So chapter number one is about the Shia school and the, div um, the diversion within the Shia school. Uh, not, how can I put that? Not diversion, sorry. Uh, how can I put it? Um, what's the word for that? It's completely missed my mind. Uh, diversity, sorry. That's the word. Diversity within the Shia school. So there are many, many firq. So Shah Abdul Aziz extensively discusses the history um, of the Shia school, um, when it was formed, how it was formed, who formed it, 
Where did the thinking come from? For example, he talks about the Firqa Sabaiya. Sabaiya are the followers of Abdullah bin Sabah. This is a very contentious issue among the Sunnis and the Shia. Uh, some of the Sunnis erroneously attribute the entire Shia school to Abdullah bin Sabah, which is a mistake. Okay, like there is a notion among the Sunnis, very famous, very commonly held notion that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani died in the toilet. You must have heard this. Have you heard this? Yes. Huh? Yes. You've heard this, right? It's a very commonly held view among the Sunnis, erroneously. Let me burst your bubble. It is not true. Even according to the works of Sheikh Allama Ihsan Ilai Dahir, uh, who had written a book titled Al Qadiyaniya in the Arabic language, um, and it had been translated into the English language and Urdu language. In that book, Allama, he clarifies that this notion that he died in the toilet is, is actually a fabrication. It's not true. Rather, uh, he gave, gives a reference from Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiyani's son, uh, who stated that his father died in diarrhea. In diarrhea in the sense that he basically relieved himself next to the bed and he fell on the bed and he died in that state. So this is how he died. There is truth to that. And we have a testimony of the son of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiyani. But some people extended that and made the story out that he died in the toilet. Okay, which is, we, we should be, we are a people of justice. Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. We must state facts as they are. Okay, so some people they attributed, they, 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 they put the entire school in the basket of Abdullah bin Sabah. No, this is a mistake. Abdullah bin Sabah didn't make the Shia school. Maybe he was one of those people who came up with some of the ideas, no doubt. Like such as, uh, such as cursing the Sahaba. Cursing the Sahaba. He was the first person who started cursing the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was a very audacious thing to do. He had an audacity to start doing that. Then, Firqa Mafdiliya, Siraghiya, Bezaghiya, Kamaliya, Mughiriya, Janahiya, Bayaniya, Mansuriya, Ghammamiya, Umuwiya, Pafwidiya, Khitabiya. So, all of these firq and diversities within the Shia school, Shah Abdul Aziz goes into every single one of them and dismantles it and explains the reasons of its uh, forma formation, where, where they came from, what were, what were the influences, and what are the reasons for the attribution to certain names, right? So, the second chapter, it goes to discuss how some of the Shia scholars, uh, scholars write books and put webs. You know, what, how, what is a web? What is a web? A trap, right? What is a fisher, uh, fisherman? Uh, you know the, those people. Are they called fisherman? Net. Net. It's called. It's called putting a net for fish, right? To catch fish, or putting your web. Okay, web is usually done by the spider, right? Okay. So Shah Aziz in chapter two, he talks about some of the ways she has. Shia scholars have used historically, and he gives evidences. He's not talking just because he thinks these things are there. He is giving evidences. Some of the ways some of the Shia scholars have used to attract people to the Shia school of thought. And some of these ways are very deceptive, uh, very, very disingenuous. And, um, and some of the ways, as you can see from the... Um, So sometimes they make a claim against the Sunnis and if the Sunnis are to be found uh, ignorant of their faith or ignorant of their own theology, they realize that there is ignorance there, so they start to throw things at you because you, they know you're not able to answer those questions. They will throw things at you to attract you towards the Shia school. And uh, ironically, some of those views are held by themselves. And this is exactly what Shah Abdul Aziz writes in this book, in, these in this huge chapter. Uh, and how many ways he calls them Kaid. Kaid. What is the translation of Kaid in the English language? Trick. No. Trick. Plot. Plot. 
Kaid, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Quran, Inna Kaid the shaytani kana da'ifa. Okay, Kaid is a plot, is a trick. So, Shah Abdul Aziz, when he writes in the Persian, in the original book, he titles them Kaid number one, Kaid number two, Kaid number three, Kaid number four, five, six. How many Kaid? How many? 107. Allahu Akbar. 107 ways, plots, tricks, strategies or stratagems used by the Shia scholars to attract ignorant Sunnis to their school. And you will find many ignorant Sunnis falling into the trap. Thousands fell into the trap when Shah Abdul Aziz was alive. And when he had realized what the hell is going on, he decided that he must do something about it. So he spent a lot of his time, a lot of hard work to write this book to protect the Muslims. And wallahi, if you look at the headings, the titles, you will know exactly what I'm talking, uh, t talking about. Kate number one, trick number one, Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, uh, they consider uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Tariq al Wajib. Tariq al Wajib is what? Someone who abandons obligations. Right? And the details can be read in the book. Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, they, Kate number two, I'm, I'm reading them in order, right? How Shah Abdul Aziz titled them. Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, they consider God a sinner, that God commits sins, or God makes mistakes. Allahu Akbar. And then Shah Abdul Aziz talks about this, that they themselves in the Shia books, there are reports that suggest that God makes mistakes. Not in our books, there's nothing like that in our books. But sometimes the Shia scholars had twisted some of the, some of the reports from, found in our books and they put them across in a twisted way that the ignorant Sunnis are completely baffled. Because they, they have never, firstly they have never read that report before. Most Sunnis are like that unfortunately. Most Sunnis, they haven't read the, uh, the, the sources carefully. They haven't. If they have read them, they haven't read them carefully. They simply don't know how to respond to, respond to some of these uh, tricks or uh, questions. Then, strategy or plot number three. Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, they claim that Allah can do zulm. So the details, I'm not giving the details, I'm giving you examples. For example, uh, um, plot number 48. I'm reading them randomly so that you know how Shah Abdul Aziz is talking about these plots used by Shia scholars to bring Sunnis into uh, Shia, Shiaism. Uh, plot number 48 he talks about is uh, many Sunni Mashayikh, many Sunni scholars became Shia. You must have heard this claim. You must have. Like you see a lot of the times Christians using this strategy. Christian missionaries, right? Ex-Muslim. Yeah. Wow, Allahu Akbar. Yeah, you see this man on YouTube who suddenly appears from out of the blue, out of nowhere, ex-Muslim, comes, becomes Christian. You must have seen this before, right? There was this guy who recently died of cancer. His name was Nabil Qureshi. Nabil Qureshi. And he used this card so much that some people became sick of it. Even Christians started to criticize him and asked him to stop using this card of ex-Muslim because you are not ex-Muslim. He was actually Qadiani. He was Qadiani, okay, and he was using this card, ex-Muslim became Christian. And there are videos with hundreds of thousands of hits, right? And then likewise, some Shia brothers and sisters have done the same, right? There is a channel called the Ahlul Bayt channel. I don't know if you've seen it, right? And they have a uh, few interviews on YouTube of ex-Sunnis. Yeah? Ex-Sunnis became Shia. And they are being interviewed. They are being interviewed. Why did you leave Sunni uh, school? Why did you come to Shiaism? And wallahi, one of them I had interviewed personally. One of those interviews, I can at least talk about one person who was interviewed. It, it was a sister who became Shia Okay, um, and uh, I met her in Norway. Where? Norway. I was there for a, for an event, and this sister came up to me, and she asked me that uh, she is married to 
a Shia brother and uh, her family is not accepting it. So I asked her to listen to your family. Okay, because some scholars even have given fatwa that it is not allowed uh, for a Shia man to get married to a Sunni woman and vice versa. Okay, um, why? Because of the problems that may appear in the children, the confusion it may cause, right? Um, so this sister spoke to me and she said that I have now um, married him and I told her that sister, he will try to convert you and you will convert, you will convert. She said, no way, I will never ever leave my school. I will never ever leave the religion of my ancestors, my forefathers. That's fine, but mark my words, lo and behold, five years later, that same sister appears on an interview, being interviewed by the Ahlul Bayt channel uh, as an ex-Sunni. And when I spoke to her, she had no idea about what Sunni school is about. If someone who doesn't know anything about the Sunni school or Sunni arguments or Sunni view on Islam, how can you even call them ex-Sunni, right? As if, so this was, this is the problem. It's like Nabil Qureshi claiming to be ex-Muslim and he was hardly Muslim, right? He was Qadiani, he was Ahmadi, right? And by the majority of Muslim scholars, their view is that Ahmadis are not Muslims. They can call themselves Muslims. They have the right to do so. They can call them themselves what they like. But according to the majority of the Sunni scholars, uh, they have given this fatwa that Ahmadis are not Muslims because of believing in another prophet. In order for you to be a Muslim, you have to believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, وسلم, was the last messenger of God. He was the last prophet of Allah. And if you believe there was another prophet after him, then you cannot be a Muslim. It's simple. It's not spreading hate or instigating uh, violence or sectarianism. No, it is stating facts. Muslim scholars believe that anyone who believes in another prophet after Muhammad وسلم, is simply not a Muslim by definition. Now those people can claim it. It's their choice, it's their life. They can claim it. But the reality is what I stated. Okay. So likewise, someone who had no idea about Sunni school or Sunni religion or Sunni view on Islam and then suddenly you, you see them as Shia because they got married to a Shia uh, woman or a Shia man, then it cannot be, you, it cannot be said that, oh, ex-Sunni. So, plot number 48, Shah Abdul Aziz discusses that this is one of the ways to deceive the Sunnis that so and so scholar became Shia, so and so scholar, and there's no reality in it. There's no reality in it. And there are some people like that today. There's, the, there's, there's this person called Tijani. Tijani who claims to be an ex-Sunni and a scholar, right? And he was confronted by Sheikh Uthman al khamis in one of the debates. Uh, and you can watch these debates in the Arabic language on YouTube. They are, they are called Al-Munazirat, Al-Munazirat Al-Mustaqilla. Uh, Al-Munazirat Al-Mustaqilla, um, if you type that al mustaqillah debates in YouTube, you will get these uh, debates between Sheikh Uthman al khamis and some of the Shia scholars. And one of them was this man called Tijani, who claimed to be an ex-Sunni. And see what happened to him in the debate, how he was uh, confronted and, in my opinion, completely refuted. So, this was the second chapter, where Shah Abdul Aziz talks about plots and stratagems of some Shia scholars to attract uh, gullible or uh, you know simple Sunnis or ignorant Sunnis to Shiism. Then chapter number three is about the predecessors of the Shia. Uh, you know what they were, who they were, where they came from, who started the the movement, and what it became later on. Chapter four is very very unique, and this is one of the best features of this book. Chapter 4, and it talks about the Isnad and the types of Isnad in the Shia books. What were the four books I mentioned? Al Kafi, Man La Yahdarul Faki, Al Istabsar, Al Tahdeeb. These four books, and mainly reports in them come from two individuals, right? Who are they? 
Imam Muhammad al-Baqir and Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. Okay, now this is what Shah Abdul Aziz talks about uh, in chapter 4 as to who are the people who are narrating from the Imams. So when our Shia brothers and sisters claim that we are followers of the Ahlul Bayt, it's a very beautiful claim. Like the Christians claim that we are the true followers of Isa salam, Jesus Christ. Yes? It's, a, it's an amazing claim. It's a beautiful claim. We are the true followers of Isa salam, Jesus Christ. And then when, he, when we ask them, uh, when you say you are the followers of Isa salam, uh, where is your evidence for that? How do you substantiate that claim? And they point to the Gospels. They point to the Gospels. And when we scrutinize the Gospels, we come to realize that they are highly doubtful. We don't reject them in, to in totality. We are not extremists. We don't reject them in totality. Likewise, the Shia school and the literature found within the Shia books, we don't reject it in totality. There is truth there. Definitely there is truth there. But the majority is falsehood. Majority is falsehood. And this is the point Shah Abdul Aziz substantiates, supports in this chapter that all of these men, and if not all, the overwhelming majority of them are either a bunch of liars or a bunch of heretics or a bunch of munafiqun and if not one of these three things then majahil they are unknown there are hundreds of reports in al-kafi someone narrates from imam muhammad al-baqir or imam jafar al-sadiq and it's, it is an rajulin an rajulin Qala Abu Abdullah. Okay? So it is narrated from a man that Abu Abdullah. Abu, the question is who is this man in the chain? Who is this man in the chain? No one knows. No one. Even the Shia scholars don't know who the man is. They don't know. When you ask them who's the man who, when Al Kafi narrates from Imam Muhammad al Bakr or Imam Jafar al Sadiq, yeah? And he attributes a narration to one of them. And the man who is actually reporting from the Imams is either unknown or one of these people, for, for example, Hisham bin Salim, one of the Shia narrators, Hisham bin Hakam or Zurara. You, you, these are some of the names, right? If these names are not there, then simply you will find An Rajulin. Okay? Or Qala Rajulun. An Abi Abdullah, okay, Qala Rajulun An Abi Abdullah, right? A man said that Abu Abdullah said this, da, 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 da. Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. So, if we don't know who the man is in the middle of the chain, we call such reports what? Majhul. No, Munqata. Munqata, okay? Munqata means there is a man missing in the chain. A man unknown is a man missing. As far as we are concerned, a man unknown in the chain is a man missing. There is not one report in Sahih al-Bukhari, in Sahih Muslim, or the rest of the four, uh, uh, four collections, right? Uh, in all the six books, Sahasitta, there is not one report which has a man missing in it. Qala Rajulin is not considered, you know, a muhaddis to put that report in his collection. Qala Rajulun, yeah? Or unless they clarified, unless they clarified that this is not trustworthy. This report is munqata. If the muhaddis is clarifying that this report is munqata, we don't need to accept it. It is only there for information purposes, right? But it's not trustworthy. We cannot trust it because the man is unknown. So what happens if the man is unknown? Our testimony, the witness is unknown. That witness is not a witness, right? So how are our Shia brothers and sisters following the Ahlul Bayt? If that is the condition. And with regards to the men who are actually mentioned, who narrate from the Imams, overwhelming majority of them have been condemned by the Imams themselves. There are contradict the, you know, first of all, the issue of Ilm al-Rajal is a joke, is a joke in the Shia school. 
in the sense that there's hardly anything on it. You know, like we have compendiums upon com compendiums uh, giving us the history of uh, 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 Rajal, right? We have, for example, books written by Ibn al-Hajr al-Asqalani, I mean, Imam al-Dahbi. Yeah. For, for the young ones, it's yeah. the narrators in the Hadith. Yes. The, what, when I say Ilm al-Rajal, I mean the history of the men who narrated the Hadith from the Sahaba and then their followers and their followers. We have almost half a million biographies. How many? Half a million biograph biographies preserved to preserve what? The Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu so there are hundreds of thousands of biographies of men that have been preserved for the purpose of preserving a simple report from Rasulullah Sallallahu For example, a report لَوْلَا أَنَ أَشُكَّ عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِي لَأَمَرْتُهُمْ بِالسِّوَاقِ عِنْدَ كُلِّ صلاة. Look at this report. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that if it was not difficult for my ummah, I would have commanded them to do siwaq عِنْدَ كُلِّ صلاة with every single salah. Right? In, this is a very simple report about brushing your teeth. Even this report has a chain and each individual in the chain is known to us by the histories written by our scholars of these men. We know exactly who they are, what they did, where they lived and why they are trustworthy. When it comes to Shia Rajal, Ilm Rajal, there is no major work like that. There are very few books on Shia Ilm al-Rajal and even they are very scanty, very contradictory and very problematic. For example, one of them is very famous, Rajal al-Kashi. In Rajal al-Kashi, you have reports where Imams are praising people like Hisham bin Hakam, Hisham bin Salim and Zurara and then there are other reports where they're saying, may Allah curse Hisham, may Allah curse Zurara and may Allah curse the family of Zurara for attributing lies to us. Now we ask them which ones, which reports are the right ones? Which reports do we need to trust? Which, the ones where the Imams are cursing the narrators or where the Imams are saying, okay, take, take the reports from them? SubhanAllah, Allahu Akbar. So how are we following the Ahlul Bayt? How are you following the Ahlul Bayt, my brothers and sisters? We want to follow the Ahlul Bayt. Now let me tell you who is following the Ahlul Bayt. We are following the Ahlul Bayt. We. The Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. How? We have reports from Ali bin Abi Talib in our literature. In Bukhari, there are more reports in Bukhari and Muslim than there are from Abu Bakr and Umar. There are more reports in Bukhari from Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an, who is the topmost man in the Ahlul Bayt according to your view. Then there are from Umar and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhumah. There are more reports. In fact, Hajj. Hajj. What is Hajj? It's a, it's a pillar of Islam. Are you getting bored? I, I haven't even yet gone to the to the issues of the Sahaba yet. Okay, but this this these details are very important. It's very important knowledge. We all need to have it very quickly. Inshallah, we're going to move on to Abu Bakr as well. Inshallah, Ta'ala talk about defending Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, according to the then you will know the true value of this book we are discussing today. Uh, so, Hajj is the fifth or the fourth pillar of Islam depending on which report. Huh? Rasulullah sallallahu he said, Bunya al-Islam wa ala khamsin, shahadati an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah wa iqam al-salah wa ita zakat wa wal hajj wa sawmi ramadan or wa sawmi ramadan wal hajj depending on which report. But Hajj is one of the pillars of Islam. And the best hadith on Hajj, the lengthiest, the most detailed hadith on Hajj on the pillar of Islam is in Sahih Muslim and it's few pages. Right? And who is narrating? Who is narrating? No. No. It is Imam Muhammad al Bakr, actually, Imam Ja'far al Sadiq. It is Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq narrating from his father Muhammad al-Bakr and Muhammad al-Bakr narrates from Jabir bin Abdullah one of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
and it is the best and the lengthiest hadith on Hajj and the most detailed one. We are the followers of Ahlul Bayt. We follow the Ahlul Bayt. And when something is authenticated from the Ahlul Bayt, we do not ask questions. But among the Ahlul Bayt, people who narrate must be learned in the field because we don't believe the Ahlul Bayt were uh, infallible, like the Shia brothers and sisters believe, that the Imams, the Imams from the Ahlul Bayt were ma'asum. They were including people like Imam Muhammad al-Baqir and Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. The reason why we take reports from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq and Imam Muhammad al-Baqir and Hassan and Hussein and Ali bin Talib because we know they were learned. They worked hard in learning the Sunnah of the Prophet But those who came afterwards, we don't have much information from them because they were not known as muhaddisin or fuqaha. They were known, not known as public teachers. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq was known as a public teacher. He taught, in fact, some reports are there that he was one of the teachers of Imam Abu Hanifa. He was one of the teachers of Imam Abu Hanifa and other Aimma. Because Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Imams and our teachers are our Imams, they considered them worthy of learning from them, worthy of being teachers. They didn't think they were masum. So, in chapter 4, Shah Abdul Aziz talks about the isnad, the status of the rijal, the men who narrate from the Imams, the Ahlul Bayt. And he proves that these people who are narrating from the Ahlul Bayt are a bunch of liars, are a bunch of heretics, or unknown people, unknown individuals. So, we can't really trust them. Chapter 5. Shah Abdul Aziz talks about Ilahiyat, theology, the Shia theology and the Aqidah about Allah, about the Quran, about Rasulullah and how they differ with the mainstream Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Chapter 6 he talks about believing in the Prophets and the Prophethood. So how the Shia uh, brothers and sisters and the scholars disagree with Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah on the issue of Prophethood and what they brought. Chapter number seven is on the concept of imama. Concept of imama. Okay. Imama is the core of our differences with the Shia brothers and sisters. You have to understand this here. Yeah? What is our main difference with the Christians? Where do we differ? The divinity of Jesus Christ was and the last one. The biggest issue is shirk. The big biggest issue is shirk. Shirk is the biggest thing, right? Everything else comes afterwards. Shirk is the biggest problem. They claim that Isa is Allah, he is God. Right? He is the third person or one of the persons in the Trinity. And Allah condemns this in the Quran. Likewise, the issue with the Shia brothers and sisters uh, uh, we have is the concept of Imama. They have come up with this concept called Imama and there is no evidence in the Quran for the con concept. What is the concept? That there are 12 Imams, okay, every single one of them is Ma'asum, okay, and Imams are appointed by Allah, okay. So these are some of the differences we have. The details are in the book of Shah, Wali, uh, Shah Abdul Aziz, Tahfa Ibn Sharia, and you have to see what he has to say on this topic. I'm not going to go into that. That's another lecture in itself, and we cannot possibly discuss all of that. So, Imamat or Imama is the main issue. So, we ask our brothers, Shia brothers and sisters in uh, humanity, we ask them simply to give us evidence from the Quran, direct evidence. If the concept of concept of Imama is so important that our salvation, our success in the hereafter depends on it, then we need clear-cut evidence. Is there evidence in the Quran for Tawheed? Yes. Is there evidence for Risala? Yes. Is there evidence for the sanctity of the Sahaba? Yes. yes. Is there evidence for following the Sunnah? Yes. Where is the evidence for their concept of Imama in the Quran? There's nothing. And all the verses they try to bring forward 
have been refuted, have been dealt with by Shah Abdul Aziz and other people. But Shah Abdul Aziz's treatment is very, very powerful. So you have to read the book, consult the book. And then uh, Shah Abdul Aziz in the same chapter deals with their reports, a hadith uh, with regards to Imama Bila Fasl, um, the issue of Imama Bila Fasl, uh, Imama Bila Fasl um, and he goes on to discuss some of the verses of the Quran as well. And then chapter 8 talks about where uh, the Shia school has gone against the Ahlul Bayt. Okay, many matters pertaining to Aqidah and Fiqh, the Shia school has directly gone against the Ahlul Bayt and he gives examples. And then chapter 9 is about Fiqh matters where the Shias have differed with Thakalain, with humans and jinns. <laughs> he talks about this in chapter 7. Now chapter 10, which is what we're going to deal with. Here, chapter 10, Shah Abdul Aziz deals with the Shubahat, the doubts, the Shia school or Shia brothers and sisters or Shia scholars bring up with regards to the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in general and in particular against the Khulafa. Khulafa al al Khulafa al Rashidin. Okay? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and then the doubts they bring about Aisha radiallahu anha or the attacks they launch against Aisha radiallahu anha or other companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Okay? So today inshallah we'll quickly we'll go through some of the doubts they raised about Abu Bakr radiallahu an and responses to them. Okay? So the first doubt they raise about Abu Bakr radiallahu an is that when Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an was on the member one day, what happened? Who's going to tell me what happened? He was on the member and uh, what happened? Does anyone know? The grandsons of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? They came and they said, get off the member of our grandfather. Get off the member of our grandfather. Yes? So, some of the Shia scholars have claimed that because this was said to Abu Bakr radiallahu an, uh, he simply cannot be the rightly guided caliph uh, because Hassan and Hussein, who were promised Jannah by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who had such a high status, came up and they said that this member doesn't belong to you, it belongs to our grandfather. Get off. Okay? So this is, by the way, the report is true, it happened, and Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an, immediately he said that I did not teach them this, because this was a very funny situation when your children come into the masjid, for example, brothers and sisters today, you know, you have naughty kids, yeah? I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying Hassan and Hussein were naughty, they were just kids, they were children, right? But sometimes you have naughty kids, yeah, and they hear things at home, sometimes the dad has said something, or mom has said something, and then they come and repeat it in the masjid. Yeah? And then the father is embarrassed. The father goes, I didn't say this, sorry. <laughs> I, had, I had no influence on this. But Ali bin Abi Talib certainly didn't say anything like it. It was a natural uh, reaction of these children who were once loved daily by this man called Muhammad Rasulullah who was their grandfather who gave them so much love that these kids it's natural, you know. It's natural. If 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 you if you have a child and you have a very close relationship with this child, and the child sees uh, someone else sitting in your place, it it is natural for the child to say that this is my father's or this is my uncle's or this is my you know grandfather's. This is not yours. Leave it. Right? This is a very natural thing to do. Yeah. They were about nine years old or ten years old. Similar. Hassan was born in. 3 Hijri and Hussein was born in 4 Hijri, right? So by this time they would be 6, 7 years old, okay? Uh, one would be 6, the other one would be 7 uh, by this time. So they were kids, they were very young kids and this is why Ali bin Abi Talib immediately said, 
that I did not teach them this. I didn't teach them this, you know. But they said, and Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he, he said, it's, it's not a problem, it doesn't matter. And he gave them love in return. But what does this prove? This prove does this prove that Abu Bakr radiallahu an was not worthy of Khilafah? Because one of the, or two of the masum, uh, Masumin had said this? No. Uh, firstly, Shah Abdul Aziz responds that they were simply kids. Okay? And kids, even if they are prophets, they are still kids. Okay? They cannot become the Imams of the community. Even though Isa alayhi salam, for example, he spoke from the cradle. What did Isa, what is the miracle of Isa alayhi salam? Huh? Sorry? What did he say from the cradle? That I am a slave of Allah and I am a messenger of Allah, I am a sign. Okay? And I will be obedient to my mother. Right? This is what Isa Islam said. But is there any evidence that Isa Islam as a child was leading his community, preaching to his community, or asking them to listen to him as a child? No. There's no evidence. Right? Likewise, Hassan and Hussein, despite what they became later on, they became great Imams. Right? According to the Shia as well as the Sunnis. Right? But both parties will agree that as a child, whatever statements they may make cannot be taken seriously because they are still children. Okay? And this is what uh, Shah Abdul Aziz refers to that there is a maqula among the Arabs. As-Sibiyu, uh, sorry, As-Sabiyu, Sabiyun, Walau Khan Nabiyan. Okay? Um, that a child is a child even though he may be a prophet. Even though he may be a prophet. A child is a child. So that does not apply. The second uh, objection the Shias raise about Abu Bakr radiallahu an is about Malik bin Nuwayra. Malik bin Nuwayra. You know what happened? Anyone knows? Malik bin Nuwayra was a man who was given responsibility uh, of collecting taxes of a certain place uh, in Arabia called Batah. Okay? And he was appointed as a tax collector by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi But his later actions proved that he was actually a hypocrite. He was a monafic. Okay? who had embraced Islam. Are you listening carefully? This is a very important matter, so you need to pay attention to this, right? This is one of the biggest um, accusations or objections the Shia brothers and sisters or Shia scholars or Shia, uh, Shia school levels at Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Okay? And what is the objection? That Abu Bakr being the Amir, Amirul Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers, he was in the position to punish Khalid for an action he did, but he didn't do it. He didn't fulfill his job properly, he didn't do his duty properly. You see, the problem here is that when you have made your mind up that someone is a kafir, murtad, someone who represents shaitan, someone who is not worthy of your respect and honor, you will find 101 lame excuses to, to tarnish that person. Agreed? When hatred is blind and justice is put aside, then you will make any excuses, any lame excuses to tarnish the person. And a lot of us are very often guilty of that in our daily lives as well. Whether it's running the masjid, whether it's running a household or a business, or when you are splitting viratha from your, your parents, yeah, what happens? All the, you know, you know, hidden, you know, evidences come out. Yeah, father has left behind a house and there are three brothers now. Uh, one brother will say, oh, you, you, you're ugly, you don't deserve it, right? The other will say, no, 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 uh, you, are, you are short, you don't deserve it. The, the other will say, no, no, you're too tall, you don't need it, right? So things like that, I'm giving examples, right? So all these things will come out. Likewise, the Shia school is built upon this notion of uh, completely divor divorcing the Sahaba uh, from the picture of Islam. Ashab Rasul cannot be Muslims. For the Shia school to be true, you have to understand these things, right? 
Ashab Rasul cannot be Muslims. Because if they are Muslims and they're trustworthy, then Shia school, by default, by extension, by consequence, is false. Right? Do you, let me explain in, 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 in simplified terms. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani, for him to be Masih Maud, the promised Messiah, Isa al Islam has to die. You understand? What is the, the doctrine of the Qadianis on, on Isa al Islam? What is the doctrine? The Ahmadis. What do they believe? He was raised dead. I mean, he, was, he died. Isa al Islam died. Some of them believe that he survived the crucifixion and then he made his way to Kashmir and he died in Kashmir. They actually believe that Isa al Islam, out of all places, he chose Kashmir. <laughs> he came to Kashmir. He couldn't go to Amazon. He couldn't go to Yani Alaska. He couldn't go to Siberia or anywhere else. He made his way to Kashmir for some reason and he died in Kashmir. Some of the Qadianis actually believe that. Believe you or not, in the 21st century. Um, okay? And in order for Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani to be Masih Maud, i.e. the promised Messiah, because that's what the claim is, that he was the promised Messiah. He claimed himself that I am the promised Messiah. I am the reincarnation of uh, Isa. Okay? So for him to be that, or he, if he's the return of Isa alayhi salam, right? Because he's the promised Messiah, right? If he is the return of Isa alayhi salam, the real Isa has to die. He cannot live. Because the Quran says, Allah, bal, bal rafa'ahu, Allah, Allah raised him, yeah, wa ma qataluhu, wa ma salabuhu, wa lakin shubbeya lahum. Yeah, they, they killed him not, they crucified him, but he was raised. So, for him to be the true Messiah, Isa has to die. So that's why they came up with this doctrine, Isa, wafati Isa, okay? The death of Isa alayhi salam. Likewise, the ridda of Sahaba, the apostasy of Sahaba was a carved aqidah, a carved doctrine to substantiate the false theology which was built by a bunch of munafikeen in Iraq mainly. Uh, you know the Shia school actually originates from Iraq. Okay, Most narrators of the reports to be found in the four Shia books are Iraqi originally. Okay, They came from Iraq. And who killed Hussein? Who killed Hussein? Do you know? Iraqi. Sorry? The people of Kufa. Mullah Bakir Majlasi, one of the greatest scholars of the Shia school from Iran, a Safavi scholar who lived in Iran in the 17th century uh, during the Safavi period, the peak of the Safavi power. He clearly testifies in his book, books as well that there was not one Syrian or Shami in the army that killed Hussein. Even though Ubaidullah bin Ziyad was responsible. The issue of Malik bin Nuwera. Malik bin Nuwera. That's why you see Ashab al Rasul, they have to be Murtads. A'udhu billah, thumma a'udhu billah. They have to be Kufar for the later Shia theology to be true. Okay? Because the religion was mainly formed in Kufa. These people were very hostile to the companions of Rasulullah in general. Even though Abdullah bin Umar. Abdullah bin Abbas and Abdullah bin Zubair, three Abdullahs, they cried to Hussein. They said, do not go to Kufa. Do not go to Kufa. Do not go to Kufa, they will kill you. They will not be loyal. They will betray you like they betrayed your father and your brother. Do not go to Kufa. And Hussein insisted, radiallahu an, and Abdullah bin Umar, who was the last one to find him in the desert, he cried and he grabbed his beard and he said, I see blood in your beard. My nephew, I see blood in your bed. Subhanallah. And he left him. These were sincere people who were crying for Hussein. Not those who killed him and then cried. Because in Yaqubi, in the history of Yaqubi, who was a Shia historian, he narrates when Zainul Abideen, Imam Ali bin Hussein, uh, also known as Imam Zainul Abideen, when he was carried into Kufa after the atrocity, he saw the women of Kufa striking their cheeks and crying, crying. He said, why are these people crying? 
Yaqubi narrates, the Imam said, why are they crying? They are the ones who killed us. They are the ones who killed us. Why are they crying? So, Ashab Rasul, primarily Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman, they have to be, they have to be kuffar, a'udhu billah, thumma a'udhu billah, for the later Shia theology to be true. And if they're not kuffar, if they're trustworthy, then there's no need for Shiaism. You see the point? That's why all these objections, lame objections, as Shah Abdul Aziz dismantles every single one of them, every single major one of them, uh, uh, satisfactorily. So Malik bin Nuwera is a very uh, common objection raised by Shia activists, Shia dhakirin or uh, speakers. You know, one of them did it recently and we responded to it. His name is Ammar Nakshwani and we invited, to, invited him to a friendly discussion, a friendly dialogue, a friendly debate, nothing hostile, nothing sectarian, nothing hateful, a friendly discussion in public, sit next to us on, in front of the camera so that your audience and our audience can see the reality, the truth. If we have the truth, then let your audience follow us. And if you have the truth, then we will give our hand into your hand and tell our audience to follow you. Can there be anything more fair than that? Right? He came up and he made a speech in Muharram not very long ago that Malik bin Nawera was killed by Khalid bin Walid who was of course a kafir to them. Right? And Abu Bakr also endorsed that, didn't actually punish Khalid for doing that. And amazingly, they don't mention Omar's objection. For some reason, all Shia activists and speakers they failed to mention Umar's objection to Abu Bakr when Abu Bakr didn't take action. Umar was of the view that Khalid should be punished. There should be Qisas and I'll explain in due course why. This is why Ali Bai was talking about this, that once you go into these things, yeah, you need to give the details. It's not, it's not very easy to go into these matters and not give details, right? So what is the issue of Malik bin Nuwera so that you have knowledge, you, have, you know what the issue was. Malik bin Nuwera was a man who was appointed by the Messenger of Allah to collect taxes from Batah, okay, uh, or Batha. I don't know what the, the pronunciation of the or what the, the, the word is actually, but it was it was uh, as Shah Abdul Aziz put it is Batah, okay. In this place, Malik bin Nawira was appointed as a tax collector by the Messenger of Allah, so and some of the Shia scholars and activists they say that imagine someone appointed by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How can Khalid do that to him? And what did Khalid do? Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an, when there, were, there was a war against apostates, okay? The wars of apostasy, do you know about them? What happened? After the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, after he um, died sallallahu alayhi wa immediately after that, when the Arabs, some of the Qabail, some of the Arab, uh, who were very weak in Islam, um, they had apostatized and the Quran points to it. وَقَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا The Arab, the desert Arabs, they say we have believed. But Allah says, no, you have not yet believed only Islam. You have only submitted to Islam, surrendered, right? So here Allah is pointing that Iman hasn't entered your heart yet. And Allahu Akbar, as soon as the Prophet died, وسلم, that reality came out and they started to apostatize. And the Jaysh of Usama, which is what I'm going to talk about in due course very quickly. The army that was appointed by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to avenge the, uh, the killing of uh, Zayd bin Haritha. Zayd bin Haritha, remember, was killed by the Romans and to avenge that killing and the killing of other companions of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, an army was appointed by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam near his death in the last days of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and who was appointed as the leader? Usama bin Zayd. Usama bin Zayd who was who was still a teenager, he was 16 years old, and who was given the command, he was given the command, and who was under him, people like Umar, Abu Bakr, and other Sahaba, Kibar Sahaba, and he was still a young lad, right? So this was to teach them humility as well, that you are big Sahaba, you are, you know, uh, you are the early ones, but 16 years old, Osama is your Amir, and Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an used to uh, tease him later on, even during his own caliphate, he used to call him Ar Amir. As when Osama used to come to Umar, he used to say, Ar Amir is here, Ar Amir is here, because of that, SubhanAllah. So, 
uh, Osama was appointed, but that's another issue which we will discuss later. So Osama's Jaish was appointed and Abu Bakr was sending it out. And some Sahaba said, no, the Arab, they have apostatized. They will attack Medina now. You cannot send this army out. And Abu Bakr said, I will never keep this army uh, in Medina or uh, held back when the Prophet ﷺ had appointed it. It will have to go. But that's another matter we will discuss in due course, inshallah ta'ala. So Malik bin Nuwayra was leader of this area and he was appointed to collect taxes, zakat, uh, usher from his people. And when Khalid bin Walid was sent out by Abu Bakr radiallahu an to deal with the, uh, the, the threat of apostasy and the Arab who were planning to attack Medina, he went out and they had one sign. Khalid had told his, uh, uh, his military leaders, people who were under him, under his leadership, that go to every single town and wait at the Fajr time. And if you hear the Adhan, then that is the biggest sign that this town is still Muslim. Then we have no hostility against them. Right? But if you do not hear the Adhan, then it is considered hostile territory. Okay? That's what Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an he had told his followers. Okay? Now in the case of Batah, where Malik bin Nawera was the leader, uh, Abu Qatada, the companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was appointed by Khalid to go and see the situation. Now, Abu Qatada had testified that I heard the Adhan. But other companions who were there with Abu Qatada, they said, no, we never heard the Adhan from this town. So Khalid bin Walid took the town. He took the town by force, right? And Malik bin Nuwera was captured. Now Malik bin Nuwera had a wife and it is narrated that Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an, he took her into his nikah immediately and consummated the marriage immediately with her. Okay, this was, uh, these were two allegations against Khalid bin Walid. Number one, the killing of Malik bin Nuwera, who was still a Muslim, according to uh, people like Abu Qatada radiallahu an. Number two, that taking his wife, okay, into his custody, getting married to her, and not even giving her time of idda. You know, idda. What is the idda? Idda is at least a period for a woman, right? And once she has had her period, then you can get married to her. But he didn't even wait for that, right? So that would mean zina. Okay, Khalid is guilty of zina. Not only murder of Malik bin Nawera, he is also guilty of zina. So these two allegations came in front of Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Abu Qatala came and he complained to Abu Bakr and he said, Khalid killed Malik bin, uh, Malik bin Nawera and he has uh, done this to his wife uh, who was there. So Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an, when he heard this, he said, Abu Bakr, you must take action. As we know, that Umar was very, very harsh and strict when it came to applying the Sharia. Not that Abu Bakr was not, but Umar was particularly feared for his stance on Sharia, on doing justice. Okay, when Umar heard this, Umar said to Abu Bakr, you have to do something about this. This is murder and zina. So Kisas is due. Okay, Abu Bakr said, no, hold on. Let me ask Khalid what happened because he is the Amir. Let me ask him what exactly took place so that he knows the context. And this is one of the reports Ammar Naqshawani used in his speech and some Shia activists used. And amazingly, 230 years ago, Shah Abdul Aziz is talking about this in his book, Tahfa Idna Sharia, for a reason. Because this is a classic objection on Abu Bakr and Khalid bin Walid. Right? But what they do is, they cut and paste, they twist and they present the case in front of the gullible, gullible or uneducated or ignorant Sunnis and they get confused. So the details are here. So when you read the reports, all of them put together, you first of all, what you do is you have to do some filtration, right? You have to separate uh, lies from truth. So there are reports. The first thing a researcher does, anyone who is researching a topic objectively, who is actually interested in the truth, the first thing you would do is you put you would put 10, 15, 20, 30, whatever reports there are, you put the, put them together and then separate the lies. 
reports that are completely untrustworthy due to the chains, due to the missing links, due to some erroneous uh, content, you put them aside. Okay, and then you look at the ones that are authentic. And when you get the bigger picture from the authentic, authentic reports, what comes to light? What comes to light is this. When Khalid bin Walid arrested, and this is what he told Abu Bakr, when Abu Bakr invited him to, to explain yourself, what happened there? And then Khalid bin Walid, he came and he explained, and there are other reports that explain that Malik bin Nuwera um, actually was thought to have celebrated the death of Rasulullah When he heard that the Messenger of Allah had died, he passed away. Uh, he had celebrated the, the death of Rasulullah and the tax he had collected from his people, he simply returned it. He said, the one who was going to take it is gone now, so you can have it back and have a party. So this is one thing. These reports came out. Khalid bin Walid heard them that this is what happened. And then Khalid bin Walid did not go and simply invade Malik bin Nuwera's territory and, and decimate everyone. No, he arrested him. The first thing was Khalid bin Walid arrested him, took him into his custody and interviewed him. What are you saying? What have you been doing? And then from the language of Malik bin Nuwera, as it comes down in authentic reports, he used words about the Prophet like Rajulukum, your man, Sahibukum, your companion. So when someone is talking about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like this, Rajulukum, your man, Sahibukum, your companion, i.e. he's not my, he's not my man, he's not my companion, he's your companion. Khalid bin Walid, when he heard this language from Malik bin Nuwera, and this is the language of a Murtad. This is the language of a Murtad. So Khalid bin Walid, when he heard this language from Malik bin Nuwera, he immediately he took his decision as the Amir, as the leader, and he punished him. Immediately he punished him. Right? So Malik bin Nuwera was uh, dealt with in that sense. Okay? And this is the detail when it came to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr an, did not take action. As for his wife, uh, there was a tradition among the Arabs at that time that the Arabs, when they divorced their wives, they kept them, they kept them, even having divorced them, they kept them in their homes. And this is what the Quran refers to. Quran even talks about this. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Wa Ida Talak Tumun Nisa Fabalagna Ajalahunna. Okay, so when you have divorced your wives, okay, let them go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that when you have divorced your wives, let them go. Don't like the Arabs. Keep them. So Malik bin Nuwera, the reports came that he had actually divorced this woman long time ago and she was kept as like a prisoner in his house. So when she was freed by Khalid bin Walid, Khalid bin Walid having known that she had been divorced, right? And she was no doubt known for her beauty. She was known for her beauty. Khalid bin Walid proposed to her immediately and she accepted and they got married. They got married. Simple as that. And her Idda period was long over because she was divorced by Malik bin Nawera and he was wrongfully, oppressively keep, keeping her in her home, in his home. Uh, so when Khalid bin Walid defeated Malik bin Nawera uh, or took over his town, she was already there as a prisoner. So Khalid bin Walid freed her and a proposal was given to her and she accepted. So Khalid bin Walid married her. Um, and this is exactly uh, what the details were. And Omar, later on, radiallahu an, he was himself uh, remorseful about his stance at that time because he rushed into it. Okay, how do we know that Omar radiallahu an was remorseful? Anyone would like to help me? Yes. Because uh, he sent Khalid to Iran. Thank you. Thank you. If Umar still believed that Khalid was guilty of those crimes, Umar would never allow Khalid to continue fighting the Persians and the Romans in the, the, the tenure of Umar bin Khattab in his reign. Right? But Umar, who was initially very angry with Khalid, when he heard this story, when Abu Qatada came with the complaints, he was very angry. And when more research was done into the topic, into the matter, Abu Bakr primarily came to realize that Khalid is innocent 
and then Umar uh, also came to realize because Malik bin Nuwayra's brother who was a poet and his name was Mutmim bin Nuwayra. Mutmim, Mutmim bin Nuwayra was a brother of Malik bin Nuwayra and who was madly in love with his brother. Mutmim was madly in love with his brother. Shah Abdul Aziz narrates his poetry as well in Arabic which he had stated or which he had uttered in the honor of his brother that um, we are so close to each other that we can live a lifetime together but when we have lived together it feels as if, uh, when you have left me it feels as if that we haven't even spent a night together as brothers right so Mutamim was gone mad uh, in the uh, in in uh, because he was so saddened by the loss of his brother but he confirmed to Umar bin Khattab Mutamim bin Nuwera told Umar that my brother was indeed a Murtad he had left Islam he was a hostile and Khalid bin Walid, whatever um, you know, he did obviously. Um, then what follows is that what he did was obviously preemptive action against hostile powers within Arabia. So this is the detail which Umar bin Khattab heard and then kept Khalid bin Walid as the leader of the armies in Persia as well as well as in in Rome. So Khalid was not guilty of any wrongdoing, and if Khalid was not guilty of wrongdoing. Abu Bakr was subsequently, consequently not guilty of wrongdoing. So, objection number three, which they bring an important objection against Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Objection number three is Jaishu Osama, which is what I talked about. So this objection, basically, the Shia school or the Shia scholars or Shia brothers and sisters in humanity, they bring up this report, which is found in their literature, by the way, it is not in the Sunni literature, and according to the Sunni authorities of Hadith, by ittafaq, by consensus, it is mawdur, it is a lie. What is the report? Jahizu Jaisha Usama la'anallahu man takhallafa. Okay, prepare or make ready or support the Jaish of Osama. Jahizu. Okay, Jaish, uh, Jaish of Osama. La and La'an Allahu man takhallafa. And may Allah's curse be, or Allah curses the one who goes against it or does, doesn't support it. Okay, takhallafa would mean whoever uh, remains behind, basically. Whoever remains behind. So, in the light of this report, Abu Bakr, he not only delayed it, he remained behind. He didn't go with Osama, the Lashkar of Osama. Okay, so Shah Abdul Aziz, Rahmatullah alayhi, first of all, he clarifies that in this report, first of all, this report is a lie. It doesn't exist uh, in the Sunni literature. And even Imam Shahristani, he quotes Imam Shahristani, the author of Al Milal, Wan Nihal, uh, he st states that this was. A fabrication made by someone. Laanallahu man takhallafa. These words are not even there. Okay, in the Sunni books. So this is a lie. And Shaykhul Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah alayhi, he even when I checked uh, for my own um, record, when I read this report and Shah Abdul Aziz claimed that this report is a lie, it's maudu, I went to my sources um, and I put this hadith there and I realized that Shaykhul Islam Ibn Taymiyyah had addressed this hadith extensively or this report in his Minhaj Sunnah and he has put different Turk in his Minhaj Sunnah and he said all of them are false they are lies okay they are untrustworthy it seems time is not on our side huh? hmm? so when I was telling you that even on this one <laughs> one issue we need to look can, uh, can we take the kids out please please You will have to take the bits out where the kids are crying. So, brother Ali, what were you thinking? We, we could go through all of this in one hour, right? Or <laughs> two, two hours. Yeah, subhanAllah. Because if you discuss a topic very quickly, you have to, you know, um, do justice to it. You can't really skim through it. Otherwise, it doesn't help because it's, it's been recorded, it's going online, and if we don't give the details, if people don't fully understand the topic, then they are 
more confused. They leave more confused. So give them the details so that they can actually go and do. So when I checked this, uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah had addressed this report and he said these report, these or all the Turk or this particular report is false, it's a lie, it doesn't exist in our books, it is something the Shias have made up, they have come up with this and uh, there's no doubt that some of the Shia authorities in the early period, they made reports or they forged hadith uh, on an industrial scale, okay on an astronomical scale okay this is why you find you know how many reports are there in Al-Kafi in one book Al-Kafi is over 30,000 reports all of Sahasita put together all of Sahasita put together over 30,000 reports in Al-Kafi okay one book one book and that's all of our Sahasita put together I wonder where all these reports the Imams, <laughs> subhanAllah, only, and two Imams, only two Imams mainly. Hardly anything from Ali bin Abi Talib, hardly anything from Hassan or Hussein or Zainul Abideen. It starts with Muhammad al Bakir. It goes like this from Muhammad al Bakir, you know. From Ali is coming like this, Muhammad al Bakir goes up like this, and then uh, Jafar al Sadiq goes up like this, and then it comes like that. It falls like this. And then the, uh, the Imams that come afterwards, there's hardly anything from them. So mainly two Imams. How did they get so much information from these two Imams and often contradictory information? Something, some strange ideas in there. And the narrators are mostly Iraqi, okay, Kufa and from Basra, okay, from Kufa and Basra, the very people who were actually guilty of killing Hussein or actually torturing um, the Ahl al Bayt. Ali bin Abi Talib was disgusted by their behavior. Hassan gave Khilafah to Muawiyah radiallahu an because of their betrayal and Hussein was eventually killed by them, right? And uh, the remaining Ahlul Bayt were also betrayed because Zayd bin Ali bin Hussein, Imam Zayd, okay, where the Zaydiya Shia come from. Zaydiya Shia come from Imam Zayd. Zayd was the brother of Muhammad al-Baqir. Okay, this is where the Shia split into two groups. Those who claim that Zaid is the Imam after uh, Imam Zainul Abideen, others claim no, it was Muhammad al Bakr. Okay, so Zaid he fought Banu Umayyah, he fought Hisham bin uh, Abdul Malik, right? And the people of Kufa were with him, and then they were not with him, right? They left him in the battle, right? So Ahlul Bayt kept, unfortunately, for some reason going back to them and they kept betraying and everyone warned them that do not trust these people and then they came up with a religion of their own in the name of Ahlul Bayt, right? So, Jaysh of Usama uh, was appointed and in fact when you read the reports, authentic reports, Shah Abdul Aziz and I think I will stop after this particular one and then we can continue in another inshallah ta'ala um, lecture in, uh, there will be a second part in the second part, we will discuss the rest of the, the objections on Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman and Aisha. We will try to put them all together, uh, choose the most important ones um, in one session, inshallah, so that we can only have two parts for this particular talk, for, for this particular lecture. So let me qu quickly deal with Jaish Usama. So Usama's Jaish was actually not prevented by Abu Bakr radiallahu an. He, in fact, if you read the reports, he was one of those people who went out of his way to make sure that Jeshu Osama actually departs as the Prophet ﷺ intended and planned, even though circumstances had changed drastically. After the Prophet ﷺ passed away, what happened? The news went out and the Arab tribes, the Bedouins, the Arab, they were already looking to attack. There were rumors that now Medina will be attacked and it will be annihilated by all of these Qabail, the sur surrounding tribes. And at that time, some people came to Abu Bakr and they said, do not send Osama with the army because now circumstances have changed. We need the army. Abu Bakr said, even if there are wild beasts ripping us apart in Medina, in the absence of this army, I will not hold this army back, an army which was appointed by Rasulullah 
So how can you actually claim that he was one of those mantakhallafa? Allahu Akbar. Where is your sense of justice? Abu Bakr was the reason as to why Jaishu Usama became a reality and it left. In fact, when Rasulullah was in his last days, the army of Usama was in preparation and it was outside Medina and then the news came to the army that Rasulullah is taking his last breath and all of these Sahaba, they became very disturbed and they rushed back to Medina to be with the Prophet and they, they, they found Rasulullah passed away and then circumstances changed. Abu Bakr was appointed as the Caliph as we know uh, in, uh, in Saqifa Bani Sa'idah and he was appointed and now Abu Bakr had come into the position of Rasulullah he was now in the position of the leadership he was the leader so Rasulullah himself was not going with the army he was staying behind and Abu Bakr did the same thing so he was not one of those people who remained behind rather he's the one who sent the army out and he requested from Osama to leave Umar bin Khattab behind because Umar was his mushir he was his uh, supporter Umar was needed by Abu Bakr to seek his advice so Umar and Abu Bakr did not remain behind rather circumstances had changed like in Islam Shah Abdul Aziz he used, uses this reasoning that a man who is a child the, the, the rulings that apply to an adult do not, do not apply to a child the ruling of a sleeping man do not apply to an awake man okay or ruling of a ruler do not apply to a normal uh, a lay person right uh, and the list goes on so the circumstances of Abu Bakr had changed from a follower he had become a leader now he had to do things differently so he was not one of those people who went against the army of Osama or kept uh, be kept behind rather his he had to stay in Medina to take care of the affairs it was a very very sensitive situation so he had to stay behind he stayed behind with Umar al-Khattab and the army which Osama left and because of that barakah because of that obedience to the messenger of Allah وسلم, sending the army out a lot of the Arab tribes when they saw the army passing their territory they realized that the, the Muslims are still very strong very powerful for them to send an army out in these circumstances they must be very powerful so all the intentions they had to attack Medina were simply put aside right so these are some of the things I wanted to share with you today in this lecture in this session inshallah we will return with more in the second part until then assalamu alaikum wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen